Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hyperthesis Podcast for our 16th episode. My name is Patrick. My name is Feely. And I'm Liam. Today we have some exciting topics to talk to you about, along with the life of a very interesting man. But to start out, we will talk about some things that we learned or did or um, just happened to stumble upon this week. And I'll go ahead and start it out just by mentioning that earlier this month, so earlier in September, which I guess is technically last month, we had the death of Frank Donald Drake. So Frank Drake was a very well-known astrophysicist within the community. He was an American who studied both solar systems and specifically our solar system. And later on, he studied pulsars using uh, radio telescopes. So he was very well known for one thing uh, outside of the field of astrophysics, which is known as the the Drake Equation. Now, this equation had a lot of different variables within it, but essentially it proposed the probability of intelligent life forming within the galaxy and the universe by taking into account different aspects like the number of habitable planets around a sun, uh, the chances of intelligent life actually forming, and also the chances of life itself forming, whether it's intelligent or not. So he was a very notable scientist who's responsible for a lot of the programs that have to do with trying to contact extraterrestrials. So he was responsible in part for the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI, or SETI, depending on how you pronounce it. But that, before SETI, it began with Project Ozma, or Uzma, who, in which it was a at first secret government project uh, to look for extraterrestrial communication. So one of our previous episodes, I think we actually talked about the Drake equation. I think you did specifically, actually, Patrick. Um, We had a a story time about alien life and whatnot, and that was definitely a big part of it, I believe. I forget which episode it was, or I would say. Yeah, but feel free to listen to all our episodes so you're able to find it. Uh, yeah. But yeah, we did. Uh, there was a story time about alien life, and Frank Drake played a very important role in it. He had many different roles, including the uh, at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. He was at JPL uh, for NASA. He also worked at Cornell University, the University of California, Santa Cruz, and also at SETI Institute. So he was a very big proponent of searching for extraterrestrial life. He was responsible for the Arecibo signal that was sent out and just a host of things related to the search for intelligent life in the universe. So was that primarily what his research was focused around or was that like his side project kind of stuff? Uh, It seems like that became a side project and later on his life, but he did do a lot of work with radio telescopes, both in observing the solar system and also pulsars, because pulsars are well observed using radio telescopes. And so that work with radio, uh, from what I understand, led to the interest in, okay, what radio, other radio signals can we receive? And the search for intelligent life that may send radio signals, like what we've done to send out signals to other areas of the galaxy. Okay. But yeah, he was uh, quite the incredible man, and he passed away September 2nd, 2022. Well, that is sad to hear, but his work will definitely live on. I have a, I think I mentioned this once before, but I have a little book, and it's like the 15 or 20, I can't remember, because I'm in the UK and don't have it with me, but it's like the so many most important equations, and the Drake equation's one of them. Um just because it gives kind of a a nice quantitative estimate of something. Yeah, so I, I encourage you to check out this famous equation, learn about it, and also learn about his other work, because 
he he was again a notable astrophysicist so it's good to learn about the history of these people uh, along with their work but moving on topics i believe liam has some interesting things to talk about from a previous conference he was at earlier yes. this month an unrelated um not not drake or astrophysics well kind of astrophysics related so yeah, I, I've I've been in the UK um, collaborating with with a mathematician slash physicist. Um, and during my one month visit, there's actually a week long conference that just ended a few days ago that I attended with my supervisor um, on asymptotic resurgence. So I'll explain what that means in a second. Um, but I I didn't really know much at all about this conference. I was definitely one of the least informed who was attending, but it was a good learning experience. So basically it was a conference on the power of small things. Um, and what do I mean by that? So in physics, um, you can, and in, in math too, you can have, um, exponential decay. So mathematically that's a function, um, E. So E is Euler's constant. It's a number 2.71828 it's e to the power of minus x and that gives you something that exponential a function that exponentially decays um and i won't go into where that number comes from um but the idea is that as this value of x gets really large the function goes to zero um so you you can think of exponential decay as something kind of vanishing it, it, another word for it is evanescence and i'm trying to think of like a physical example um but I can't off the top of my head. Maybe you know one. Uh, I know, it, at least in physics, the evanescence is clear when you have internal total reflection. There's a little bit of light that gets out, and that de decays quite quickly, which is yeah evanescence. I was trying to think of um, I was trying to think of like a kind of real world example that. The av like the average person might know someone who hasn't dedicated their life to physics or science, you know. Yeah, I'll, well, you just shut me down. I was gonna say, well, if you think of quantum tunneling, yeah, yeah, I can, <laughs> I can, I can give examples, but, but, but quantum tunneling is an example. Um, so if quantum tunneling is like a particle hits a wall, and the wall is, is more energy than the particle has, there's a small chance that this particle can leak into the other side, and that's described by an evanescent wave. So the, the probability of this particle transferring through this wall it becomes exponentially smaller the kind of bigger the wall gets. But anyway, so this conference... Oh, yeah. Yeah, the evidence is... I remember it's one of the few metal band that has a female, female lead singer. So that's one note to it. I don't know how they choose the, the name evanescence, but when I heard it, I was like, well, that sounds like physics, and they're, you know, they're like corn and stuff. Like they're yeah. not very physicsy. <laughs> well, that there's a real world example for you. <laughs> we couldn't think of one, so I'm glad someone else did. Um, but yeah. So anyway, basically, you have things that are exponentially small. Is my point. Um, and when in in one one big up. Uh, point of this conference was on um, a method of mathematics called like asymptotic analysis so basically asymptotic so if you say if, if something's very far away um you can how do i word this so imagine you're looking at a tree you're standing like i don't know a meter away from a tree and you can see all these sticks and branches and roots in the trunk and little ants on it and maybe even some fruit but if, if, if you start walking away from it and you get very very far away from it all the kind of details of that tree kind of fade away and it, the tree will start to kind of look like, well, in my opinion, it will kind of look like a piece of broccoli from really far away. So I like to, this is some example I just made up on the top of my head, but I, I, I like to call asympt asymptotically far away from the tree, which means you're very far away, but you're not so far away that you can't see it. The tree looks like a broccoli. So this broccoli, you're approximating what a tree is by a broccoli when you're asymptotically far away from it. So in terms of an exponential, exponentially decaying function, if, you're very, if, if your value 
some parameter, your distance is very large, your your exponential decaying function is asymptotically zero. It's very tiny. It's like point zero 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 so on one. Well, to give a little background on the word asymptote too, for people who are not used to that in math or in calculus, because asymptote is well, we use it all the time, kind of, but we understand what it is. Asymptote for me basically means something a line or something that looks like it's approaching, but it will not touch. You know, it's like approaching this this number or this line, but really close, getting closer and closer, but we will never touch. That's the point of it, right? Like to have to limit to infinity and you know, quote unquote, touch it, but technically it will never touch. That's just a meaning of asymptote. If you take the number one and divide it by two, you get a half. And if you divide that by two, you get a quarter and so on. And if you do that infinitely, an infinite amount of times, you'll, it'll asymptote to zero, question mark, or is it zero? Well, the, the one over x function is, is approaching zero, right? But the limit is to the x, to infinity is zero, but that's that's the limit. It's not the actual value, right? Yeah. Uh, I think there's an actual paradox centered around that, and it's called Zeno's paradox, uh, where if you shoot an arrow, first it has to travel halfway, and then it, but still has to travel quarter way, and then so it will. The paradox is it will never reach the target, even though it actually does. So a little fun asymptotic paradox. I th- I think the reason why it does reach the target is because space isn't or you can only oh okay I don't want to get into the minimal length scales of the universe and stuff so maybe that's a topic for another time but anyway I was attending this conference which is about asymptotic analysis so in math turns out math is very hard um a lot of it you just can't do so you have to make approximations or you have to numerically do things so like you know, if you have an y equals mx plus b in front of you, you can arrange that really nicely. But a lot of math, you can't. Um, so asymptotic analysis is one way around that. And it's a really powerful thing. So at this conference, um, sometimes when you're kind of trying to describe the physics of a system, you can make these asymptotic analysis or analyses. You can take these, you, you can approximate things. And in these asymptotic approximations, sometimes these exponential terms, these decaying, these evanescent terms, they get thrown out, which is usually fine. Um, But it turns out in certain situations, if you throw those out, they'll cause problems later. So these tiny little contributions, these small exponential, these exponentially small corrections to your theory, um, they'll cause things to go wrong later if you ignore them. And that's what this field is called. It's called asymptotic resurgence. So these exponentially small things sometimes resurge and you actually have to take them into account. You can't ignore them. Um, so mathematic, so as a mathematician or a physicist, you can say, okay, that's fine, but why do we care about them in the real world? Well, asymptotics approximations, uh, they're used in the real world. Um, one example, like mathematicians, engineers, physicists, like one, one example is you might be modeling jet engines in a plane and a guy here, the guy I'm working with actually, <clears throat> excuse me, he's done that. Um, so if you're trying to understand a jet engine and you miss out on something, something could go wrong later. So you could get a potentially explosive exponential terms <laughs> appearing that you weren't able to describe. And next thing you know, your jet's in the ocean. I mean, I think that's a bit of an exaggeration. Um, but the point is that in real world systems, this can happen. So this program I was at for the week was basically to bring together the people in the world who study this resurgence. Um, and it, cause it turns out that mathematicians kind of figured it out and then physicists also figured it out, but they kind of did it in their own different ways. So without realizing the other was doing it. So this conference was to bring everyone together on the same kind of same playing field. Um, and it has tons of applications again, like I, I don't actually, The reason why I attended is because this stuff has started to show up in my research a little bit. So I didn't know very much about it compared to the people presenting. 
Um, but it shows up in like fluid mechanics, these like jet engines, like I said, pretty much anything that describes waves it can show up in, um, like ultra cold atoms, quantum electrodynamics, and a big application of its string theory and quantum gravity. Um, relativity kind of stuff. Um, I was really interested in all the quantum electrodynamic talks because it turns out that this thing is a huge, um, this resurgent stuff is like really popular in QED, quantum electrodynamics, because quantum electrodynamics, Feynman diagrams are a perturbative approach. So <laughs> we could have a whole topic on Feynman diagrams. Um, Richard, one of Richard Feynman's famous creations, which are extremely useful in physics. But basically, for the physicists out there, um, each kind of vertex in a Feynman diagram is a is a it, Feynman diagrams are perturbative. It's like a it's like a power series Taylor expansion. And again, the physicists will appreciate that. If you don't, um, essentially a perturbation series is another way to approximate things. It's like the opposite of an asymptotic approximation. Instead of things being big, you're now approximating things on a very tiny scale. It sounds like we're going to have to do a whole episode on, uh, on, on, on this, especially mm -hmm. QED Feynman diagrams and everything. Just yeah. But I, I guess to sum it up, my, my point is that these QE, like quant quantum field theory Feynman diagrams are a perturbative approach, but you ignore non-perturbative effects, which are exponentially small corrections, and you have to use this resurgence to take them into account. So although not a lot of people are into this research, I, it seems like a one of the next big things, although I could be wrong there, but it seems pretty useful to me. Yeah, I think it might work pretty well in probably like some kind of dy dynamical system that that maybe the scale change because like those things the why the reason they can ignore those small or you know corrections because you know they work in the certain configurations that you know that they're allowed to be they're allowed to be ignored but if you have some kind of dy dynamic system where things change then that might be another story that's maybe why these resurgence start to happen and also like when you develop something, you know, you start to think not just that the act that, that model itself, but what it would be, right, in different situations. And that would require basically create more degree of freedom. And I think now we have pretty good understanding of, of a lot of things in physics and in science. And probably the next step is going to be where Liam was talking about, like, well, do we really understand it? it all the facets or all the size of it which we have been ignoring for a long time because it works for us really well but now we're moving on to something more and more intricate and complicated that these little things come back to bite us yeah that's that's a that's a really good point actually especially the dynamical bit that's a good point yeah anyway it's really cool stuff i definitely there's a lot that just flew over my head i'm i'm no string theorist um, I also am no mathematician, but I, I got a lot out of the conference. So I'm going to be looking into that in the future. I'm sure I'll mention it again. Well, I, I, I look forward to hearing more about asymptotes in, in the future, especially sneaking them in there like, um, like you do with your current research. Yeah. <laughs> but moving on from asymptotes and conferences and very complex things that are produced through mathematics we'll now switch gears and talk about complex things that are produced by nature and how humans are trying to use those complex systems and create things based on them in something called biomimicry or biomimetry yeah so i don't think any of us here are experts in this so so bear with us, but it's this really cool new kind of, I don't want to say it's a new science because it's kind of like a mindset that you apply to different types of science, but, but it, it kind of also is its own form of science. Um, so imagine, you know, you, you want to, you, you want to swim faster. You can swim, but like, you're not the best. So you can be some kind of engineer and you can come up with like, 
all kinds of different ways to make yourself swim faster. Or you could simply look at creatures that already swim and just kind of take their natural traits that they've evolved over millions and whatever years and then create something out of that. So I like the idea that you see that ducks have webbed feet to help them swim or like some birds or seals like flippers and that kind of stuff. So instead of just using your feet to swim, you create, um, oh, what are they called? Like the flippers you wear on your feet while you swim to help yourself propel faster. So I don't know if that's technically a form of what biomimicry is, but essentially biomimicry is looking to nature to kind of come up with ways to solve human problems. And it's this fairly new kind of type of science. It's not super new, but it's it's really taken off in the last um, few years. Well, I think in terms of science, it could be relatively new if you compare to the astronomy. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. <laughs> but people have, do, have been doing that historically for a very long time. You think of a lot of inventions that human had. You know, when people would try to fly, Back in the days, like when you want to fly, what's the first thing they do? They look at birds. You want want to swim, swim. They look at fish. So I think it's a very intuitive thing to do because if you think of um, nature as like a huge, well, I got throw the word here, huge Monte Carlo simulation or huge kind of randomish sim- like control simulation, yeah, you know, and just take over multiple generation to create a very very optimal thing for first specific purpose and just copy that so you don't have to. We think of uh, think about how to solve that problem because nature already solved it. Yeah, it is exactly like flight is the big example. Um, Leonardo da Vinci, as early as the 1400s, he was trying to figure out how to make a flying machine, and he he wasn't successful. But he took a lot of his kind of inspiration from birds in his notes. He he really he went and like studied the anatomy of birds, like very in depth to try and understand how they flew. So like noticing things like they have hollow bones, so they weigh less, um, that kind of stuff. And even the Wright brothers, who are the first, well, I think they're the first to create kind of heavier than air aircraft. Um, they they derived allegedly derived their inspiration from um, pigeons. So yeah, it, it is a very intuitive thing. It, it's like how do I solve this problem? Well, there's this animal that already does it really, really well, so I can probably just copy what they're doing. Yeah, I remember there's this um the the train system in Japan or something or somewhere. It was probably figure out what's the best way to you know give out tracks and stuff. And they're like, well, they so what happened? I think they used some kind of either fungus or something. And they put food in a different spot where the stations would be, and the fungus would create a network, and would be optimal. Why? But without having to for us to design anything, we just put a fungus there and create this huge network that works perfectly. So you just follow that easy. Yeah, I remember seeing that actually, where like they would put the fungus down, put some food around it, and the fungus would kind of like spider web out, but it would somehow figure out the most optimal path to the food and then create it. Um, so that that is an example of um, biomimicry. Um, actually, though, um, it's it's now another thing to call it is um, biomimetrics, or sorry, not metrics, biomimetics. Um, but that's harder to say than biomimicry. So I'm probably just going to keep saying biomimicry. Um, but yeah, it, it, so there, there's like even you know the obvious example I gave, like flippers. There are these more in depth ones like fungus networks, and even like. Again, it's intuitive, but it takes people surprisingly long time to do this. You people create solar cells for solar power, um, and then they look, they turn to plants because leaves, trees, you know, plants they photosynthesize much more efficiently than any solar cell that we can produce. I don't know if that's true now, but it was at one point. So they're like, oh, let's study how plants turn light into energy, and then we can maybe apply that to solar panels. Um, so it has a lot of application and it turns out that evolution did a really good job. (laughs) All these creatures that there's some wild creatures on the earth, like mantis shrimp is one of my favorite examples. Um, 
some of them are just wild. Like, even think of elephants. Like, how did this creature develop this massive nose that it uses as a hand? Like, it's pretty wild to think about. So these creatures are, like, they've evolved through natural selection over a very, very, very long time to be very well suited to a particular environment. So the, 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 usually they've done it better than a human ever could. Well, I kind of dislike the, the saying that nature does a good job. I mean, the, the system that nature has is in a way it does a pretty bad job because less than 1% would survive because the only thing we see around are those that, that are good. The bad, they, they die off. That's kind of the point, right? If we keep on with evo- if with the system of evolution, well, it's basically like eugenics, <laughs> where you're like, well, you you guys just have bad genes, die, which which to me, for you know, in terms of humans, kind of unethical and and bad. But you know, that's what happened in nature, right? The fitness, the only the fittest survive, only the one that mutated correctly. The ninety nine point nine 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 percent that mutated incorrectly die off. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't say it's a good system. Well, it's it's good for humans because we can take the most refined species, I guess, the best creatures that have survived, and take their best traits and figure out how to solve our problems with them because we can't I guess, do it on our own. I guess. Yeah, the key for uh, this system is also time, right? Like this evolution has been over the past millions of years. Um, um, in in contrast to this thing like artificial, artificially induced um, mutation, like how we breed dogs and stuff, that's over ten thousands of years. It's much faster because we kind of know what we're doing. But nature, it's just like, well, we gotta let the animals go in the wild and figure out. Yeah, <laughs> is is. Yeah, it takes a lot of time, and humans don't live that long. I think that's one of the problem. We have to wait for it to figure out. But we also have these bacteria and viruses who have really short lifespan, so they adapt really quickly, which also is a problem for us, as we can see with COVID mm-hmm. and other diseases. Yeah, so maybe I'm, I'm, that's a, I'm wondering if there, now that you say that, I'm wondering if there's... Um, bio biomimicrists i don't know what to call a scientist who studies biomimicry but i wonder if there's scientists who look at how certain how certain viruses and bacteria are fought off and then try and apply that to medicine i mean maybe that's already been done i don't know i know in a similar vein that there's been work going into what are essentially nanorobots that are based off of the shape of viruses and how they inject DNA and things like that. So instead of injecting a virus and causing damage, they're looking at, okay, this is how a virus works. How can we make something similar to a virus but inject, say, a a gene into a cell that will then trigger some sort of cancer-killing mechanism or some sort of treatment that's provided through virus-like structures, but they're man-made. So we have biomimicry not just on the large scale, but also on the very small scale. And we also look at how different cells function and their internal functions, and then we can use those in the field of uh, microbiology and medicine to help solve some issues that would that our solutions just don't work for. Yeah, so biomimicry, you, you see it has all these different kinds. It's, it's everywhere without you realizing it. Um, so, like, historically, it started off as these kind of macro scale things. But now it's getting to, like, the micro and nano scale as kind of science can approach those length scales now. Um, so, yeah, so, so Otto Schmidt was the person to kind of come up with the first the first person to come up with the concept of um, biomimetics although again it'd been it'd been used before but he was kind of the first person to sit down and start writing down that this is a concept on its own not just a one-off idea so he during his doctoral research he developed something known as a schmidt trigger um because he was trying he was studying the nerves in squid and he was basically trying to perform biomimetics he was trying to engineer a device that replicated um the biological the biological system of nerve propagation um and maybe that's something we can talk about another time um 
But a few years later, a man by the name of Jack Steele coined a similar term, uh, bionics. So, so it was around the 19 kind of um, 60s, 1950s, 60-ish, this field started to become recognized by scientists. And the term biomimicry first appeared in 1982 um, in a book by the scientist named uh, Janine um, Benyus. I'm definitely pronouncing that wrong, but I apologize for that. Um, but essentially, she published a book in 1997 called Biomimicry, Innovation Inspired by Nature. And in that book, she def defined biomimicry as um, a new science which studies nature's models and then imitates or takes inspiration from these designs and processes in order to solve human problems. So, so, so she kind of suggested that looking to nature as a model, measure, and mentor for solving human problems is what she said. Um, and she also um, kind of emphasized sustainability as an objective of biomimicry, which which makes sense to me. I mean, if you're looking at plants to understand how solar cells work, you don't want to be creating solar cells that, I don't know, only last an hour. You want them to last a long time, like a, like a tree might, I guess. Yeah, I think um, calling it a science is kind of strange to me. You know, like to me, that's, more in terms of like engineering plus design plus architecture rather than science because science is not about mimicking nature it's about explaining nature or like the scientific methods <laughs> like well that's mimicry just doesn't really use scientific method right like it's it's not about figure out how the world works it's about applying the things in the world to suit your purpose so it's more to me it's more engineering and architectural I, I would argue that there is definitely a strong engineering and non-scientific component, but I think it's also important that we ask the question. So if we see something and ask, can this work elsewhere? And, and then studying if it can. Uh, an example that pops to mind is the process of photosynthesis and how leaves work. We've been trying to use the sunlight for energy and solar panels and other photovoltaics, but by studying the process of photosynthesis and the generation of sugars and other carbon-based molecules from carbon dioxide and a little bit of sunlight and maybe some water in there, uh, we can study these still and say, okay, if we're looking at a leaf, we try and replicate this process. Does it work? What's effective about it? What kind of efficiencies are we achieving? and what's possible with it, which I, I think is pretty fundamental to science is testing if something works, uh, which is also a basis of engineering, but there's a lot of, well, does it work in science? Yeah, that's kind of what I was, like at the very beginning of this discuss discussion, I was saying that like it kind of is a science, but it's kind of not. It, it, it's a, it, it's prob I don't know if it's been, depends on your opinion, I guess. Um, maybe later and maybe in the future it'll become more formalized. But yeah, it, it's kind of like, it, it, it's a mind, I like to think of it as like a mindset that you apply to science, although maybe it is a science in its own right, because that's a good point. You are, you're kind of looking at something being like, all right, can, does this work only here? Or does it work elsewhere? But yeah, it's, it's pretty neat how like, how many application, how, how often it appears, um, both at the macro and kind of micro scales. So there's a ton of examples and I've, I've written this math. Well, I had a massive list and I cut it down and it's still pretty big, but so I'm going to list off some other examples of biomimicry, certain reusable adhesives. And they got, came up with those from studying, um, kind of the adhesion abilities of geckos and lizards. Uh, something about this one specifically, it's interesting to see the different processes that occur with making these reusable adhesives. So if you've seen like a gecko climb a wall, it sticks to it. There, there's an actual adhesion going on. And if you look very closely at a gecko's foot, it almost has very tiny barbs uh, in the foot. And it's this whole foot just padded in barbs. and 
these barbs are generated from cells. Now, trying to manufacture that not using biological processes, so not using cells, but using, say, regular manufacturing processes is extremely difficult. So it's, we're able to mimic it, but in very small scales, because at large scales, it's very hard to manufacture, whereas I guess nature makes it look easy. So that's another side of biomimicry is we might be mimicking the, the mechanism that happens, but not the way that that mechanism is produced in the first place. Well, one other example, which is pretty much what you just said, that actually does happen at the macro scale, and this is one of my other examples, is Velcro. Um, Velcro are these little barbed kind of hooks, and you push them together and they stick. And that was actually inspired by a plant, um, cockleburs. Because they're those like little balls, those pointy looking balls that if you walk, like in a field, you walk through them, they'll hook onto your clothes and or your hair or whatever and that's how they travel and reproduce and spread so that was actually part of the motivation for um velcro so again biomimicry but that's like it's a bigger scale than um it, it's an example of a macro scale thing that kind of relates to what you just said about the adhesion so maybe there's this in-between scale where they don't work or maybe when you try and apply the adhesion to larger scale it's harder to do i think there's that's a more complicated problem than just a scale too, because if you think about life, is is well, we are carbon based life form, right? And carbon is so special that you know the all the organic material has carbon and it can be transferred around everywhere. So when when animals create their own well mechanism or features, they they can just build it out of the organic material, right? But if you try to imitate that. We don't. If we want to create uh, like something that mimic it, we can use organic material as efficiently or as well to build it because we don't have the the method to build it. With well, what with life, the method just encoded in the genetics. So we have to come up with a way to create, like you said, the li- little, th- you know, the little barb thing that for for cells is easy, right? It's all encoded in each cell and. They use the same material because it's already there, those organic material in the cells or whatever they eat or whatever they collect. But if we want to imitate that, we have to rebuild one by one. There's no um, microscopic roadmap or like a blueprint that we can just automatically create them. I think there's a few of like self-assembly that are exploring these kind of thing where, where like, oh, what type of, um, thing would assemble on its own. Maybe it's an entropy problem. Right? So I think what I find really interesting are people who manufacture, manufacture things to self-assembly. If you remember, some of our friends in undergrad did some microsphere self-assembly, some graphene self-assembly. I think that's going to be a big thing in the future where, you know what, if we put things in the correct um, conditions, the um, material we want would just self-assemble. So we'd have to actually carefully decide each and every single small parts of it. But because we have this spatial environment, things would form through its own way. That's how I think people do creating crystals, right? Like we don't, we don't really go align each atoms. We just buy this little nuclei and we put in some solution that has crystalline um, well, crystalline material in it, and if we just um, what's, what's that word for deposit into the crystal and create them? So that's kind of self assembly. What can you do it in a um, different scale? Yeah, I think you're right that it's a big thing in the future because if it's it's easy, well, I say it's easy enough. I mean, it still has its difficulties, but it's easy enough to throw a bunch of atoms together and create some crystal. But it's it's I feel like it'd be much harder to make some self assembly thing. Um, process for like an actual usable item which solves a problem you know like this adhesion stuff so yeah i feel like that if you can do that that's there's there's big potential there i mean it's interesting to see how we're moving some processes of self-assembly from these very non-organic machine-based processes to organic processes so instead of trying to replicate uh, things that happen in nature, such as spider silk being produced, for example, where instead using organisms or 
some sort of biological relation to produce the substances instead. So instead of trying to replicate it, we're actually using them themselves. Uh, I think one example is uh, we, we've been trying to replicate spider silk and just silk in general for many, many years since it's such a useful material in terms of its strength to weight ratio. And instead of trying to toil at it, uh, which we've been doing, some researchers said, well, what if we just take the genes from this and put it in a different organism? And that's how we get silk coming out of a goat's udder, which is very interesting. I would highly recommend looking it up. But we're using these, we're, we're using biomimicry and these biological processes that happen in one animal with animals that might be better suited for example mass production of silk so it's interesting to see that we we already have kind of these self-assembling processes happening on a larger scale but using organisms instead of some sort of industrial manufacturing process yeah because i've always been thinking about genes as blueprints just this little blueprints inside us right it's like DNA is such a simple like protein too. Is it protein? It's just simple material like ATCG, isn't it? Just like a few, four bases, and that that's just what encodes what going to be going on in life or how life is created or your life is designed. Well, designed is a strong word, but <laughs> how you like come to right. So I can see those GMO being a big thing, right? Just like mod- just modify the blueprint and. The thing is, it sounds easy, but it's just really difficult to to basically read. And you know, I I know people do like genome sequencing. Like uh, people are like, oh well, we have like fifty thousand genes, or, or like you know, C codes. That's that's so little. That's nothing. Like if you think about your code, fifty thousand is like fifty kilobit. That that's literally like six thousand kilobytes. Like that's that's tiny, you know. Like that's not much to, I was called decode at all. So I'm kind of stumped why we have still f- haven't figured it out. Which I know, I think the sequence we figure it out, but which part works on what? I think that's very challenging. Yeah, first glance might be simple, but it's it's definitely a super complicated thing, um, or else we'd understand it a lot better than we do now. Um. Quickly, since our time is starting to, it's getting there. I'll just list off some other examples of biomimicry that I thought were neat. Um, so woodpeckers, like the bird, they've developed a few more things. So one example is a kind of ice pick for mountain climbing, because if you want to make a hole in the ice or something, um, how do you, you need a tool that can do that well, but you don't want it to be too heavy and woodpeckers beaks they fly around they're not that heavy and they can smash into wood with it another thing is helmets um woodpecker skulls are the way their anatomy is like their skull and their brain and the way it's all designed lets them kind of hammer their head against a tree all day without getting a concussion so i've heard that people have studied kind of woodpeckers to design better helmets or better kind of like collision safety um there's a whole bunch of them here Uh, one, one one neat sciencey one is a wind driven uh, planetary rover design which maximizes drag and it was designed um they they studied tumbleweeds to come up with this i don't know the details on that but i think that's really funny actually uh, another cool one that's more so related to this sustainability is wind turbines so humpback whales they have essentially ridges along their fins that make them glide through water better something to do with turbulence and reducing turbulence so they took that kind of bumpy texture applied it to the edge of a windmill and it reduces turbulence and increases efficiency of like wind turbines which is also helps with sustainability for better power generation yeah i I, i'm interested in that because that's something that happens in um with with golf like sim- it sounds similar to how golf balls work because you think if you have a perfectly spherical golf ball going through the air why do they put all these little dimples in it and it actually the dimples reduce the turbulence and that causes it to go further but um 
related to that, um, Olympic, certain Olympic athletes, um, their swimsuits are designed to have less resistance. And that came from the skin of dolphins and sharks. Because if you zoom in on it, on the microscopic scale, it's designed a very certain way. So they've applied that to kind of swimsuit design for Olympic swimmers to give them that tiny little extra edge that they want. Yeah, I speak on the golf ball thing, when Title Ice number one, I think, came out, it was it changed the game because the, the I think, hybrid core is somehow, right? It's, instead of a solid core, and it somehow makes the golf ball go much further, farther, and then it changed the game. Everyone was so mad. I think it was banned for a little bit at some point, and then they couldn't ban it. So it was a little crazy at the time. I will also say that shark suits are banned from the oh, Olympics they? because they were just too good. Yeah, they they were full body suits, too good, so they got banned. But are they the suits that have that like shark skin des- like design on the micro scale? Oh wow, I didn't. I thought yeah, they would only make a small difference. I didn't realize because I, I didn't realize they'd make that big of a difference. But yeah, oh, yeah, <laughs> that's what I was about to say. Biomimicry, a lot of applications, and I only got through like a small amount of them. So it's it's this kind of upcoming thing, especially on smaller scales. And I'm, I think it's really cool. Yeah. So I have like a kind of argument against biomimicry a little bit too, because what <laughs> I do is basically the opposite of that. Because what, at least what I'm trying to do in science is to get away from this heuristic process. So heuristic just means like, you know, learning by doing or like trial and error. And the point of what I do is to create knowledge structure. So if you know how it works, we don't have to try, try do the trial and error. So luckily for nature and what we do in bio, biomimicry is that we have this vast uh, database of you know heuristic process that have been done over millions of years. So that's why it works. But if you think about, oh, you know what? I'm going to design a new phone by mimicking other phones. It doesn't work that well because it's... No, the time hasn't been that long. So at least what I'm trying to do in science is to create this knowledge that or like understanding how things work. I think at least for scientists, that's what we're supposed to do rather than using this heuristic process to find things. And at least for me as a physicist, we try to, you know, understand using maybe come up with theory of you know the quantum mechanic, the QFT, all the things. We are not trying to um mimic or see what nature is doing but like by trial and error which is a big part of science in experimental science right trial and error is a huge thing but the end product of it would be a theory that works not because it's heuristic but because we have a good understanding of it hmm. yeah no, that's a that's a good point actually like it, it makes sense in terms of um nature because all the all the trial and error mistakes have been made via evolution so we don't have to make them but yeah i guess we don't really understand how how they got there um maybe on some level we do but not fully so yeah it it makes sense for for that kind of stuff but like you say you know physicists study atoms there's no yeah there's no natural there's no ancient line of phones that have evolved for us to study, so we have to we have to understand certain things from base level up. But we can get away with um kind of not stealing, but kind of copycatting uh certain aspects of nature. I I think both are very important. I think why trial and error if there's already a solution at least at first. Maybe later you want to trial and error to understand it better. But at at first glance, it might be good to take something that works and then build upon it. Well, speaking about trial and error and the existence of things that for for long periods of time, we're going to hear a story about that. But before we get that started, I'll just let you know how you can contact us. Uh, you can reach us at our Gmail account. So we're hyperthesispodcast at gmail.com. You can also reach out to us on Instagram. We're at the hyperthesis. Feel free to give us a follow and comment on our different posts. We post every time we'll be posting an episode, so you will not miss one if you're subscribed or liking, following our Instagram. Also, if you're interested in being a guest on our show, or if you have suggestions, comments, queries, concerns, please send us an email, contact us over Instagram, or if you know us in person, feel free to just send us a message. 
We can be found on almost every podcasting service. We're hosted through Anchor.fm, which is run by Spotify, but we're also found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music slash Podcast, or really wherever you find your podcasts. So feel free to describe and leave us a rating and a review, as that will help us uh, get more reach. So moving on to our story today, we talked about biomimicry and talked about how evolution and the earth itself is kind of like a playground for things to perfect themselves and for organisms to gain adaptations that have helped them thrive in very niche regions and in particular niches. And one of the important people in the field of evolution is Charles Darwin. So Charles Robert Darwin was born on February 12th in 1809 in a place called Shrewsbury, Shropshire, which is a very fun name to say. It's in England, close to the Welsh border. And he was the son to a doctor slash financier, Robert Darwin, and his wife, Susanna. They were a wealthy family, and Darwin, Charles, we'll call him for now, was one of six children. So from the beginning, Darwin's, the whole family, was very tied to religion. So this was in the 18th century. So there was a lot of progression with the Industrial Revolution and everything, but their family was still quite religious. And throughout his younger years, Charles attended religious-based schools. Now at the age of 16, He worked as an apprentice doctor with his father, who was also the town's physician, uh, helping the poor within their town of Shrewsbury. After deciding that he didn't really want to be a doctor, his father still pushed him and he attended the University of Edinburgh Medical School. And this is where he started learning more and more about natural history, which he had been fascinated with from a young age. So he joined several societies at the Edinburgh Medical School uh, relating to the subject of natural history. And these different groups and would help develop his love for the natural world and would lead to inspirations that he would later use to write down his very well-known theories. During his time at the University of Edinburgh, he also learned taxidermy from John Edmonston, who was a freed black slave that was a part of several expeditions from Europeans in South America. And so he was able to learn over the course of 41-hour sessions the different anatomy of animals and how to properly stuff them and undergo the art of taxidermy. Now, this was just a brief glimpse into the natural world for Darwin, and eventually he would get involved with Robert Grant, who was an anatomy and biologist, a naturalist, and someone who was studying the life cycle, uh, in particular, of marine invertebrates. So Darwin, being what is essentially a research assistant at the time, helped Robert Grant try and study the anatomy of different marine invertebrates and how they live, what they do, and in doing so, gave a couple presentations to the different societies he was a part of and start making a name for himself in the world of naturalism. Now, since he was in school to become a doctor, but wasn't really interested in it, his father sent him to Christ College in Cambridge, which is where Liam is right now, and he was told to work towards becoming an Anglican country parson which is essentially the same as a priest or minister. I'm actually at the Churchill College in Cambridge. You're still in Cambridge. (laughs) Now, uh, during his time at Christ College in Cambridge and studying towards becoming an Anglican parson, uh, he was introduced by his cousin to the field of etymology through his cousin's massive butterfly collection. Now, etymology, which is the study of insects, led Darwin to start collecting beetles, and he was encouraged to collect and study beetles by his cousin apart from school. 
Now, he did finish his school, though it was a Bachelor of Arts in 1831, but he soon became more interested in studying natural history in the tropics specifically. He was inspired by people like Alexander von Humboldt, who wrote a, a very excellent, almost diary journal of his time in the tropics and exploring the tropics. Uh, I've read that book for re my research, so I would recommend it. But this curiosity of Darwin's led him to gain more interest in the natural world. And after several excursions around Britain in that interest, he was appointed a, to the position of a naturalist for the ship called the HMS Beagle. And this ship was captained by Robert Fitzroy, who was looking for a naturalist as he explored and tried to map the coastline of South America. And so this intended two-year voyage would help map the entire coastline of the continent. And during that time, Darwin was supposed to take notes and just act as an all-around naturalist for it. So the, after a couple delays, the Beagle set out at the end of 1831. And instead of taking two years, it was an almost five-year journey. Now, after a quick trip across the Atlantic at the start of the journey, uh, and a quick stop in Cape Verde, or Verde, yeah, Verde, off the coast of Africa, the Beagle did reach South America, in what is now Brazil, where Darwin spent a lot of his time on land. So Darwin was prone to seasickness, so he stayed on land while they were doing the mapping of the coastline. And during his first few weeks, months on the ship, uh, he made a lot of notes and studies about marine invertebrates, just like what he did with Grant. Uh, and in particular, he observed phytoplankton. However, when arriving in South America, he discovered the bones of extinct large mammals. And he kept these bones and found more and start creating ideas of where species come from and how they ended up in different places. And a lot of its influence, both in geology and in the origin of species, come from Charles Lyell, who he later worked with quite closely, but who wrote The Principles of Geology, which had several original ideas, some of which are still present today, about where species originate and also just how the earth was formed and how it's changing. Now, Darwin didn't necessarily agree with all of his ideas, especially in the origin of species. And during his time in the Galapagos Islands, as they were going around South America, he noticed that there were several types of birds, now known as Darwin's finches. But at the time, he didn't even know they were finches and saw that depending on the island they were on, they had different adaptations, in particular different types of beaks, that were useful for different types of trees that were present on individual islands. So these birds Darwin collected and took back to England, along with several other species. Uh, he noticed some ch differences in turtle shells as well, including the pattern, and discovered that you could figure out which island a turtle was from based on the pattern on the shell, but they ate all the turtles that came across their ship. So he wasn't able to salvage any of the turtles to bring back. Uh, during the circumnavigation of the Beetle, they also stopped in Australia, uh, on a few islands in the Indian Ocean, at Cape Town in South Africa, and then back to Brazil and back up to England. And now, during this time, Darwin kept very extensive notes and took back specimen. And when he arrived back in England, he then had the specimen uh, analyzed and uh, identified by scholars in England. So during this time, he received funding from his father and became what was known as a gentleman scientist, which sounds pretty awesome, having not to worry about funding and just being called a gentleman scientist. And during this time, he worked closely with other well-known naturalists to try and identify and work on theories of how species came to be and how there are so many species, and also a bit on the origins of humans themselves. Also during this time, 
he was under a lot of stress, and one of his daily notes I found particularly interesting described marriage, and he weighed the disadvantages and advantages. The advantages were you get a constant companion and a friend in old age, and he also noted that it's better than a dog. However, the disadvantages that he listed were that you have less money for books, and it's a terrible loss of time. Now, he did end up marrying his cousin named Emma, uh, but we won't delve into that too much. What we will delve into just a bit more is the publication of his first book, which he says is an abstract for further work, and looking at it from that aspect, it's interesting to see how such a powerful book is just seen as an abstract, and this book is called On the Origin of Species. So this is Darwin's book describing the process of natural selection as he observed it, and how slight ad- adaptations in offspring can lead to an increased chance of survival. Now, we mentioned earlier that it's very, there's a survivor bias where if you get a wrong adaptation, you'll probably die. But if you get the right ad- adaptation, which for the most part is based on random chance or random mutations within your genes, then you have a better chance of survival, and that adaptation is then propagated through your offspring. And uh, this book described in detail what Darwin observed. He didn't go much into the origin of humans, and he only actually mentions the word evolved once, and it's the very final word of the book. Later on, Darwin would go on to really work out evolution and suggest it as the process in which humans evolved and his next major publication was called The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex where he delves further into the origins of man suggesting that we are all the same species which at that time was not necessarily known and also saying that we're animals and that all man derives from one place which we know is most likely true nowadays. He also had a lot of other publications on plants uh, and plant behaviors, and he was an avid writer, so he had many different small publications and books that he published throughout his life. Now, Darwin passed away on April 19th, 1882, to what was most likely heart failure, and he had been suffering health issues all throughout his life after returning from his voyage on the Beagle. Now, he was supposed to be buried close to his home, He is now buried at Westminster Abbey, laying close to John Herschel and Isaac Newton because of his incredible influence in the sciences. Now, in terms of evolution, Darwin was certainly not the first. Uh, One of the first ones was John Baptiste Lamarck, who came before Darwin, and he suggested that an organism can pass on characteristics to its offspring. And it does differ from Darwin's theory and the fact that it doesn't talk about adaptations or natural selection. But there were certainly a lot of different theories of evolution and how species came to be that were being discussed at the time. Now we have a lot more solid evidence towards Darwin's theories and expansions on his theories. But it's interesting to see all the ideas that were had and just the thought and ideas that Darwin had to look into what was happening with species and their adaptations and why they were different. So I think Darwin's writing has definitely had an impact on modern science and especially on biology and even biomimicry and how we see these adaptations that we use play out in real life. And now we're getting into a world where we have a lot of artificial selection and we're getting into gene editing and everything but we can thank darwin and his love of the natural world for the ideas that we have about evolution and where we came from and with that we will end the podcast thank you very much for joining us today we hope you enjoyed this episode and have a good day thanks for the story patrick See you all later. Take care.